So last week, we spent some time focusing on widening the circle for your teenagers with adults that will invest in their life and walk alongside of them throughout their middle school and high school years. In fact, research from Fuller Youth Institute tells us that teenagers that have at least five adults they know they can turn to with spiritual questions and doubts are more likely to have their faith stick with them into college and beyond. And so this week, we're focusing on the principle, begin with the end in mind. You know, the ultimate goal of parenting is to raise an 18-year-old toddler, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I wish I could push pause on the phase that my boys are in. You know, it makes me a little sad sometimes to think that I'll only know Knox as a five-year-old and Brooks as a two-year-old once. There's this app called the Parent Q app that I have on my phone that I try not to open if I can help it. But it's also important for me to open it whenever I can. Because in the app, it shows me how much time I have left with Knox and Brooks before they graduate which is really kind of messed up, honestly. It, it wrecks you when you, have, when you see how much time you have left. Autumn Ward writes, when you count the weeks you have left with a kid, you stand a better chance of making your weeks count. If the ultimate goal of parenting is to raise our kids to become adults, we have to begin with the end in mind and then take steps to get there. One of the things I used to do with my grandfather all the time was play chess. And if you've ever played before and you play to win, you know that you can't play only thinking one move or even two moves ahead. You have to constantly be thinking three, four, maybe five moves ahead. And sometimes your opponent does something to throw off that plan, and so you have to adjust your strategy. Another way to think about it is to think in football terms. The goal of the offense is to score a touchdown every drive. And while the hopes of every play called is to score, sometimes the offense takes a, dif a different approach. The strategy sometimes has to be field position. And so you have plays that are designed to set you up for success to move down the field, not just to score. And the same principles can be applied to parenting. Parenting is not just meant to happen day to day. We have to be thinking through strategies on raising our kids in the phase that they are in and the phase that they are about to be in. I want to give you a sneak peek in on our next series and share some research on raising our teenagers through the phases. And we all know that babies think different from toddlers, who think different from preschoolers, who think different from elementary kids, who think way different from middle schoolers, and who think very differently from high schoolers. In Kristen Ivey's book, It's Just a Phase, so don't miss it, Kristen's research shows that preschoolers think like artists. They experience the world through activities that stimulate the five senses. Preschoolers blend reality with imagination and learn through participation. And then we have elementary age kids who think like scientists. They understand the world through concrete evidence that they can test repeatedly. These kids discover how things work through repetition and clear application. These are the phases that most of us have already experienced if we have middle schoolers or, or who have had middle schoolers. Which brings us to those lovable creatures that change every six minutes and 23 seconds. Our middle schoolers, they think like engineers. Engineers solve problems by connecting concepts so that they work together. Middle schoolers personalize abstract concepts by connecting ideas. And finally, as your kids get older, high schoolers, they think like a philosopher. Philosophers seek to understand what is unseen and what cannot be measured. High schoolers want to discover meaning and learn best by processing out loud. And knowing how kids think in each of these phases of their life helps us remember that they're always changing, which means that we also have to be changing in our approach, changing the ways we parent, and change the way we talk to them and with them. And practically speaking, when families intentionally and consistently embrace the value that God is God, it's a lot easier to parent from a single-minded perspective. You know, Moses did his best to remind the people of Israel of God's place as the single most important relationship in each of our lives. In Deuteronomy 6, Moses starts by addressing Israel, saying, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. In other words, God is the one thing. He should be the one thing in your life as the parent, and he should be the one thing in your kid's life. Moses is saying that everything he is about to say hinges on this one eternal truth that trumps everything, that our God is God. And I want to throw out one thing for you to chew on. What if we began acting like our kids' relationship with God was more important than their relationship with us? How would that change the way that you parent? Now, I'm definitely not saying that your kid's relationship with you is not important, but sometimes we have to be able to distinguish more clearly between what matters and what matters most. 
I think sometimes it's easy to make the mistake of trying to compete with God. I know I do. I mean, I, I want to be the hero in my kid's story. I want to be the most important thing in their lives. But there's a key difference between being an influencer or leader in our kids' lives and trying to be everything to them. And I hope that this doesn't discourage you, but I hope it empowers you to take some pressure off yourself. It seems like parents are hanging so much of their success on whether or not their child is happy all the time or not making mistakes. Your kid's happiness is not dependent upon you. Whew. They are growing into their own and into adults. And here's an important thing for us to remember. What I give to my children or what I do for my children is not as important as what I leave in them. God has designed you to be a part of his story. But God has also designed your child and teenager to be a part of his story as well. According to a study by the Barner Research Group, 85% of parents believe they are primarily responsible for, for their children's spiritual development. And 96% of us parents feel primarily responsible for our children's moral development. You know, in our student ministry, our vision for our students is to help them own their faith, value a faith community, and discover their personal mission. But the only way we can do this is if we partner together as parents and, re and we're able to help reinforce the spiritual guidance they're receiving from home. In his book, uh, Scream Free Parenting, Hal Runkle writes, you need to create a space for your child to develop a relationship with God on their own terms. Does this mean you do nothing? Of course not. You actively create faith discussions throughout your child's development. You introduce them to the faith tradition that's led you this far. And above all, you live in a way that reflects the highest values of that faith. The ultimate goal of parenting is to launch our children into adulthood where they are self-directed, decisive, and responsible people. So let's talk about some practical ideas. The first thing you can do is to ask them questions. Each week, I send out an email called the Parent Q email. And in this email, you get things that range from our calendar to resources or blogs for you as parents. But I also send out what series we are in what verses we talked about on Sunday, and what the bottom line was from the teaching message. And this gives you parents the opportunity to ask directed questions. You could ask, tell me one thing that stood out to you today. Or how do you think the verse that was talked about today works in your life? Because when you make conversations a part of your family's rhythm, you help develop their faith into their own as they get older and older. After asking them questions, I want you to share your own story. Research from the Fuller Youth Institute shows us that most kids don't know their parents' stories of how they came to love Jesus and follow him. Now, this doesn't have to be a, a big one-time conversation where you sit your kids down and say, I'm about to tell you my story, so get your popcorn ready. Uh, no, but, but there are ways that we can organically work a few minutes of our faith into our conversations with our kids. It can be what you learned about in your daily Bible study or what you're praying about specifically or even what God is showing you about life or parenthood. Most likely your teenagers are not going to come to you and ask you about any of those things. So you could say, hey, can I share something with you that I learned today? Or, you know, I've been, I've been praying for my friend who is sick. Do you think you could pray for them as well? Or you could say, can I be honest with you? I've, I've been struggling with my patience lately, but I found some scripture that helped me. What, what do you think? And these conversations might be difficult at first, but the studies show that they are so worth it. And when it comes to imagining the end, when you share your faith and life with them, it models how they can do that with others when they're ready. And the last idea I want to share with you is one of my favorites it's called Wow, Pow, Holy Cow. This is a modified version of our highs and lows that our small groups do. These can be dinner conversations or just check-ins before bed. Wow is the best part of your day. What, what happened that just really made your day great? Pow is obviously the worst part of your day. What happened that maybe put you down or was a source of frustration uh, for you and your student? And then holy cow is something in, in their day where they see God. It could be something they did or something they saw someone else do. It could be something that God revealed to them through the spirit. But here's the kicker. They have to at least answer holy cow and then they get to pick wow or pow. They can definitely do all three if they want, but the goal is to shoot for two each time. And when they know the expectation is to look for God every day, they'll begin to look for God every day. And beginning with the end in mind forces us as parents to answer this question, who do I want my child to become? 
The challenge for you this week is to ask God to help you gain a clear picture of who you want your children to become as they grow to become adults. What does their relationship with God look like? How would you describe their character? What would those who are close to them say about them? And throughout this whole process, ask God to help you focus more on who your children are becoming rather than what they are doing at any given moment. Watch how your attitude, your perspective, and your priorities begin to change as you parent your children with the end in mind.